G'day folks, welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to do something I've been putting off for way too long now and deal with the uh, old Sears Silvertone console stereo once more. This was my grandparents' old stereo, built in about uh, 1967 or 1968 or somewhere around there by Fleetwood of Canada for Sears. And the reason it's taken me this long to get back to this is because I've been waiting and waiting and waiting, trying to find schematics for this, and I never have been able to. So, uh, yeah, we're just going to have to wing it and, see, and hope we can get this thing going. Although it is going. It's just I wanted to recap it and make it happy for years to come. But uh, since I've never been able to find those schematics, this is only going to be a partial recap today. A lot of the problems we're going to encounter during this is going to involve germanium transistors and diodes. I don't want to heat those up because uh, I've got no way to mitigate that heat. And uh, heat is bad for those types of transistors and silicon parts and whatnot. I don't want to have to replace transistors at all in this thing. I just want to get this to uh, hopefully behave itself for several years in the future and maybe get some more life out of her. A lot of memories attached to this, so I want to try and keep it working. Not just for my sake, but for the rest of my family. There's a lot of memories in this. Anyhow, today what we're going to do is we're going to do the partial recap. Like I said, I've got all the parts here, and I've had them for like a couple years now, so uh, that shouldn't be too hard. Well, probably will be, but I don't know. And we're gonna change out all the, the lamps in here, the, the indicator lamps. I think I've got those. And um, finally, once I'm sure that this is working and it's been running for a while as a test, we will get into the console itself and replace the speakers because one side is not factory original anymore. So uh, yeah, I've got the speakers right over there. They're ready to go. Audax Dome Tweeters and Dayton Woofers. And yeah, should be fun. But first we gotta power this thing up and see exactly what its functionality status is right now in 2024, because I don't think this has been powered up for a couple of years. So we could be blowing stuff up here. Just make sure the power's off. It's plugged in. And power is on. It's quiet, but I do hear something. I've got the bejesus cranked out of it right now. We should be getting more volume than we are. Even with the uh, car speakers I'm using to test this with. So I wonder if she's going to have enough power to drive the new speakers. Oh well, I'm not going to worry about that. These controls are still a little tight. I dribbled some sewing machine oil in the uh, front of the pots to try to loosen them up, but the uh, treble isn't doing it very well. Some connection issues in there as well. Oh, there we go. There's more volume. I guess we got to get in there and clean these switches too. Well, that lamp is working. Let's see if we can get the local station on her. Oh yeah, there it is.
anyway, we got to get started on this. I'm going to turn it all the way down and uh, we're going to replace some lamps first. And I should be checking to make sure I got the right voltage lamps here, shouldn't I? Well, that's picking up the local station better now. Okay, do I have the right lamps? Oh, come on, there's got to be something there. I got 33 volts at that pin. Just trying to figure out where these lamps connect to is all. I bought six volt lamps. Obviously that's not gonna work for 33 volts. Well folks, I think I found the problem with the indicator lamp sockets not getting power. The problem is this wire right here. This is right out of the main transformer. It's a sep sep separate winding from the uh, main power circuit and uh, it appears to be open so there is not going to be any indicator lamps working on this machine anymore. At least I don't think so. I might put the lamps in and see what happens but uh, yeah I do remember getting power to that circuit the first time I tried this out, so I don't know what's going on with it, but uh, yeah, it's a very simple circuit. It comes off one transformer winding and there's nothing there right now, so not much I'm gonna be able to do about that. Because uh, in order to, to make something else work, I would have to have the appropriate lamps and I do not have the appropriate lamps. So that's not gonna work anymore. Now, while I was at it, I decided to check all these capacitors here to see what voltage they were running at the moment. This one's at 16 volts, and they progressively increased from there to 35 volts on this one. And it's a 35 volt capacitor, so that one's running right at the uh, limits of its specification. So I'm a little uncertain about la that one, but... Uh, I do have replacements for all of these. They will be getting done, and this one will be getting done. I didn't measure that one, but I'm just going to operate on the principle that it's probably working. <laughs> but uh, I just want to move to the power amp real quick here, because for the longest time I couldn't figure out exactly what the heck was going on in this uh, power amp, which is over here. It just confused me. I just didn't know what the heck was going on. And then I saw a video on Trevor's bench. He was servicing an old Harman Kardon receiver. And he happened to show the uh, schematics for a similar receiver higher up the food chain in the Harman Kardon, li Harman Kardon lineup. And uh, I was looking at those schematics that he was showing and I thought, I'll be damned, that kind of looks like exactly what's going on in this thing right here. And sure enough, it is the same kind of topology. Basically what we've got going on here is we've got a two-stage amplifier here, interstage coupling via transformers. It's basically like an old tube amplifier except using transistors instead. And uh, there's two transistors per side here. Obviously, one's PNP and one's NPN. There's one here, one up here, and uh, the other side, there's one here and one down here. And then the interstage transformers are one here, and then there's one down here somewhere. So, yeah. I'm hoping it's not going to be too hard for me to recap this. There aren't very many capacitors to deal with. These two will be getting changed, for sure. I don't think there's any germanium transistors I have to worry about here. These four, I don't know. They look like they're going to be tricky. There are solder pots in there that I could heat up and uh, just solder them properly, but I might J-hook on these ones, if I can even get enough length to J-hook two on these ones. But yeah, I want to change all six of these capacitors here, but uh, first I kind of want to check them for ESR. 
might as well do that while we're here. But before I do that, I want to take my meter here. And I'm going to show you exactly how I discharge these capacitors for measurement. Basically, I've got this little adapter made up here. That's a bleeder resistor. It is 5 watts, 2 kilo ohms, and it just plugs right into the meter right down here. And I fire up the, the meter in voltage check mode, and we're just going to see if there's any voltage potential across these capacitors before I start testing on them with the uh, ESR meter. I don't imagine there's any significant voltage across these, but never hurts to be safe. Yeah, that one's empty. As is that one. These may be output coupling capacitors, in which case I would really want to change them. Let's see, can I get access to these other ones? Good question. Well, I can get one side for sure. I can't even see the other side. This one's going to be a pain to change out, I'll tell you what. Nope, there's nothing in that one. So very likely the other one's discharged as well. Yeah, that's the issue there. Oh, and I, I will also mention that these big capacitors back here, these are for the voltage rails of the power amplifier. They're running at about 20 volts, so that will give you some idea as to the power output of this thing, which is not very high. <laughs> yeah, I didn't think I needed to discharge those caps. Let me get the ESR meter out and we'll see what those are doing for ESR. I want to see how they're holding up after all these years. Okay, we'll get these two big boys here first. Point one, that's actually quite good, considering their age. That one's the same. Those do not need to be changed, actually. 26 ohms on that one. That might be ungood. 44, those need to be changed. Now, can I get to this one at all? Point five five. Not too bad. Point five seven. Not too bad. So, I did check these, right? Yeah, these were the high ones. I want to change those for sure. But I'll do all six of them if I can possibly manage to do so. Anyhow, I don't know if there's too many others I want to check in here, at least not in the power amp. We'll get into the tuner a bit here with the ESR meter, because we might as well. check these five big cans up top here but I have to discharge them first I'm thinking okay shall we find out yes we shall yeah that one's got a little bit of something in it not much 
I could have left that sitting right where it was. Okay, now discharging that one. That one's doing all right. At least for discharging. Not sure about ESR yet. Well, we're going to check the ESR right now and find out. See if I can angle this so you can see what I'm doing here. Point two five, good. Point seven three, yeah, probably good. Point one two, definitely good. These are all the same value. Point one oh, definitely good. Ooh, that one's really good. So I don't need the uh, meter anymore. Everything else we're going to measure is small stuff. Thought I heard the sound of a clock ticking. I don't know what that was. I don't have any mechanical clocks down here. 10 ohms on that one. 15 ohms on that one. 3.4. Yeah, these probably all could use changing, but I'm not going to. I'm basically not doing anything with the tuner anymore. Can't pick up anything here anyway. Yeah, 4.7, not too bad. I don't know about these weird brown ones here. Yeah, they're fine regardless. And I'm not gonna bother with the big yellow cans, I'll just replace them, or rather I won't replace them per se. I will leave them in the chassis so they look good, but uh, I will tack the new capacitors in underneath here somewhere. Hold them in place with the uh, RTV or something like that. I think I can get them both in here, the, both new ones. The new ones are gonna be significantly smaller than those big yellow cans. This is the other interstage transformer, by the way, for the power amp. I might have to move that in order to get the new capacitor in there. But yeah, I think I've got what I need to uh, get started on this. So how about I do that and I'll get back with you. Well, I feel like an idiot. The lamp sockets are actually working. Forgot that they were running at AC, not DC. Ain't that just lovely, so I guess I'll do that first. Okay, shall we see if we got our panel lights back? I'm going to plug in and we're going to turn her on and we'll find out together. Should be working now. And yes, it's lit up. It's hard to see because it's kind of bright in here with all my lights going, but uh, yeah, both of them are working. So uh should be fairly easy to... Uh, Hook up the uh, the one in back there and uh, get the power indicator on the console itself to work because uh, apparently I bought the right bulbs. So I guess I'll shut off now and I'll start on the capacitors. All right, folks, the recap is done. As you can see, I've got the whole power amp done, all six of them. These two were the hardest, but I got them done. I had to... Uh, sort of move things around and insulate and all kinds of other stuff to get this to work, but uh, I think I got her. And these two were kind of tricky up here as well, but 
again, I got her. The problem with these two is I ordered 150 volt parts or something like that, and I only found 10 volts across them. So, uh, yeah, could have gone a lot smaller, but uh, these have measured, I think, something like 3.3 ohms ESR, and the other ones were 25 and 45, and at least one of them was leaking. So, uh, physically leaking, I should say, not electrically. Well, possibly electrically too, but uh, I fired it up after I did these two here, and the amp's got a lot more volume now. So, uh, yeah, hopefully the rest of these are fine now. I haven't tested it since I did those two in the middle here, but uh, yeah, should be fine. And I'll show you the rest of them down here. Here's the four new ones for this area. I'm not really that comfortable using uh, 35 volt parts where there's 34 point something volts, but it should hold up. And as for the new uh, uh, power amp rail volt capacitors, here's one here. I decided not to uh, do anything with the uh, RTV, and here's the other one up there. They're both working fine, and uh, like I said, the two capacitors two big yellow ones are still there but not being used. So we got to fire this up and see how it works now. And then before I continue on with uh, doing anything else with this, I'm gonna have to run it on the table here for like two or three hours just to be sure it's gonna be stable long term. Kind of hard to do this while I'm holding the uh, camera gimbal but we're managing. We can do this. All right, now if I can just get my speakers reattached here. We'll fire it up and see what it do. Okay, we gotta do the ones in the back as well, of course. And those connect back here. And yeah, the power amp makes me the most nervous because uh, I don't know the topology. I just don't know it very well at all. So uh, I hope this thing works now and continues to work. All right, we are plugged in. Let's power up. Lost AM again. There we go. Yeah, it's plenty loud now. I still don't know why it takes so much time to get the AM going, but uh, all I really wanted to do was get the amp done and uh, the power supply and those have all been done now so we should be good to put the speakers in the in the cabinet now and put this thing back in the cabinet as well but uh, like I said I want to run this on the table here for a couple hours just to make sure it's gonna work and I think I'll run it off the auxiliary so I don't have to listen to static all day Okay, folks, this thing's been running for about half an hour now, doing just fine. I'm using the MDSE 10 to supply a signal for it. And yeah, it doesn't seem to be having any problems. However, I found some concerning numbers with the uh, at the speaker terminals for DC offset, and I wanted to check those real quick right now on camera with you. I tried to do some adjusting on these potentiometers here. They don't seem to re really do anything, so I put them back to their default positions for now. But uh, very likely I'm not going to be able to do anything about this DC offset thing. Unless I get schematics. And I don't have schematics, and I don't expect to find any schematics. 
just trying to get the uh, probe set up here. And we're just going to check to see what we got now. This was the good channel earlier. And it's still good. 43.8, something like that, millivolts. But it's the right channel I'm kind of worried about. Let's see if I can get a good connection here. Yeah, 128. The good news is it seems to be stable that way. And it's playing audio just fine. As you can hear. So yeah, I'm not exactly sure what to do about that. If I do anything about that. As it is, I'm inclined to go ahead and do the speaker replacement and just throw this all back together. So I'm probably going to do that now. But I think what I'm going to do is I'm just going to uh, put the whole thing back in the console and I'll run it on the speakers that are in there for maybe a, a day or two and see how that goes. And maybe I'll recheck the DC offset then. And if it still hasn't moved, then we'll go ahead and do the new speakers. All right, folks, it's been about a couple of days now of this thing running just to make sure it stays running and it seems to be doing fine. So we're going to get the new speakers done for it. Ignore that flickering light. I've got another one of these god awful LED ceiling fixtures going out again. Honestly, some of the most unreliable technology I've ever experienced, but whatever it is what it is. But I just want to show you how this thing looks in the dark, if I can, real quick. There you go, that's how she looks at the moment. It says it's tuned into a station, but it, all it's picking up right now is interference, which is usual for this house, so... Uh, yeah, it can't actually pick up any radio stations where it currently is located. And I even got the uh, power indicator on the bottom fixed. That was a bit of a pain because I had to get underneath and re-solder the uh, ground wire to the uh, socket again, but uh, it's working. No problems whatsoever. So let me turn the lights back on here so you can see again. And yeah, it's time to get the speakers done. I'm going to measure for DC offset one more time on both sides and see if it's the same. And if it is, it probably is. We'll just go ahead and do the uh, swap. So let me get you over back to the table and we'll talk speakers for a second. Okay, speakers. But before we get to this, I've got a couple of announcements to make. First, I've decided to go ahead and implement my plans for my major home theater upgrade in 2025. I just ordered my first brand new amplifier in years for that purpose. It's a big one. Eight channels, 2,000 watts combined. So I can't wait to show that to you guys when it gets here. But uh, yeah, I wanted to start the process early just so I didn't have a chance to talk myself out of doing so the next year like I did uh, four years ago, the last time I had the chance to upgrade my home theater. So yeah, that's one announcement out of the way. And for the other, I regret to inform you that... Uh, Apparently, something happened with my order for the uh, Sony Idler tires for the TCK-75. Apparently, they got to Canada just fine, and then for some reason, they got shipped right back to Europe. So, uh, yeah, I hope those things get here, and we can do our uh, planned video on the TCK-75. I'm running about three weeks in advance now, so that should be enough time to get them here a second time, but... Uh, We'll just have to see. I just hope they don't get sent back a second time. I told the eBay seller to correct a couple of things on the shipping address. It should have still gotten to me the way he had it, but uh, just trying to make sure this time. So, uh, yeah. Summer of Sony is on simply a small halt for now, I guess. But uh, that's okay. I can find other stuff around here to do to pad things out. Anyhow, let's get to the speaker stuff here. First off, I'll show you the tweeters. I went Audax for this. Here's the label. These are dome tweeters. They're slightly more sensitive than the woofers are. 
And this is them, they is. I decided to go for the, for this model with the large plate on it because I will be having to uh, adapt from a 3-inch cone tweeter to this. And I didn't want to do too much modification, so uh, this is what I went with. Should get the job done nicely, and it's much more powerful than the uh, tweeters that actually are in there right now. We'll talk about that a bit later. But, uh, yeah, those are the tweeters. I've got two of them, like I said, and there's the sticker on the back there. For woofers, I've got these things. DC 250-8. I have modeled these in the, in the uh, sub-enclosures in the actual console stereo, and they work perfectly. So, uh, these should work well. These are 10-inch, naturally. They seem to be fairly well built. This is my first experience with Dayton audio drivers, so... I'm kind of curious to see how these sound, but uh, nice of them to uh, put a little uh, gasket on the uh, flange here, which I will not be using because it's being mounted to the back of a panel inside the console, but uh, yeah, this should do fine. I don't know if I've got terminals for these, so I might be soldering directly onto there, but uh, we'll see what I can dig up after I stop shooting this segment. But yeah, we've got our woofers, we got our tweeters, and for crossovers, I've decided to go as simple and and low quality as possible. Basically, all I'm doing is a tweeter in series with the uh, capacitor in series with the tweeters. I can't think or talk again, apparently. So yeah, I chose three kilohertz, so this should do, and you'll notice that there are six of them. This is because I'm using another two of them for uh, for the new speakers I'm planning to build for that uh, Pioneer receiver. So yeah, that's another project i got to get going pretty soon here too. So maybe I'll use that to fill out the time between here and the time those new idlers get here. Alright folks, I hope you can see and hear me. I've already depopulated the uh, wiring from the various drivers in here, so... Uh... Let's try and get them out and see what we got here. Try to do this without knocking you over. It looks like I'm going to have to use the uh, outer tweeter locations. Because I don't know if I've got room for for doing them on the inner locations like I'd want to. But we shall see. All right, that's one tweeter off. Just a simple cone tweeter, nothing fancy. Three watts, eight ohms. Yeah, we're going up significantly in power. Let me just get the uh, the one Audax tweeter I got unboxed, and we'll see how that fits. Okay, let's check this out here. Oh, I think it'll work. Yes, I think it'll be fine. Now, I should mention I am planning to uh, upgrade the grill cloth material in this as well. Just not anytime soon. That'll be done during the uh, actual restoration part of this. Just having a look here to see what the uh, screws are for the woofer here. Alright, out comes the factory woofer. And I'll show it to you in a second here. 
I'll just grab you real quick. There it is. Not much to look at, but then it doesn't need to be much to look at. Looks like we've got a one inch voice coil in there. So plenty respectable. Not much in the way of magnet, but it, of course it wouldn't need to be much in the way of magnet. So I'll put you back in here. Yeah, you can see this little grill cloth here. It is acoustically transparent because I can see light through it. Actually, I can see what's lying on the floor through it. But, uh, yeah. You can see where that decorative bar goes on the outside. Right about there. So, I guess the next thing to do would be to mount up the, uh, the Dayton woofer and see how, this, how that thing fits in here. And like I said, I'll leave this tweeter in, in place because I need a, a hole locked anyway, so might as well just go ahead and leave it there. All right. In comes the Dayton. Let's see, probably best to have the terminal block this way. And yes, I do believe this will fit. Just fine. I tell you what, this is not the easiest thing in the world. This thing is extremely low to the ground and I'm extremely tall. Well, I got one in. I just got to do three more. Okay, we got one woofer done. I will probably do the tweeter off camera because it's been a pain enough to just do a woofer like this, but uh, yeah. Whoops, sorry about that. Now I'm going to take you over to the other side to show you the monkey business that's going on over there. Now, before I show you this, not all of this is my fault. The woofer on this side was changed, and one of the tweeters was blowed up. So, yeah, this is what we got going on here. That is a Marsland Princess 10. And if I can show you, that's a realistic dome tweeter up there. That replaces the blown up... Uh, cone tweeter that was there and uh, this one was still good the reason that one is still good is because the uh, the two tweeters are wired in series so basically two three watt tweeters in series that was to protect it from factory because they couldn't quite get the uh, the thing set up properly for uh, running them in parallel because the tweeters aren't powerful enough for that Anywho's, I gotta get this Princess 10 out of here and that dome tweeter. Well, I don't know. I could leave the dome tweeter, but uh, most likely I'll just move this original tweeter over to here. And uh, yeah, that's basically how I'll do this side. And up here, there's a leak up there. So I don't know if I can find a way to permanently fix that or not, but I'm gonna try. So I'm going to shut you off now and I'll get back to you when the, all this is done because this is a real pain trying to video this. Well folks, I got it done. Wasn't easy. I'll show you what's going on in here now if I can. There you go, new Dayton woofer, new Audax tweeter. Should be good to go, but I'm not exactly sure yet. I still have to uh, solder the terminals to each of the woofers yet, but uh, I'll do that once I know for sure everything works. So 
let's try it together on camera and we'll see what happens. Oh, if I can get out of here. Where is my extension cord? Trapped underneath me, of course it is. All right. We are hot. Or you might be hot, but I'm not hot. I haven't been hot in like 20 to 30 years. Anyway, see what we get. That was a mic concerning. For a minute there I thought I had a blown out tweeter on this side. And I'm not paying for another Audax tweeter, I'll tell you that right now, but uh, now it appears to be something in the console, possibly with the uh, temporary wiring back there. So uh, how about I shut you guys off and I go make the wiring permanent and uh, we'll test after that. Well gang, I think I'm finished with this. I hope I'm finished with this. That was exhausting. The way I sealed up the uh, the tuning port in there was I used RTV sealant and I also used the same RTV to uh, tack the capacitors down to the tweeters so they won't go anywhere. But we're going to test this using the Sony mini disc unit here. And we're going to see what happens. Sounds like I got both tweeters, so that's good. Let's see. Let's go with this one. I gotta tell you, it sounds much better than it used to. <laughs> Is it perfect? I'm thinking no, but...
Okay, I've heard enough. Holy crap. This thing has changed for the better big time, I gotta say. Much better. Much, much, much better. The sound quality out of this is fantastic now. I was doubtful that the uh, that I modeled these right, but no, I modeled them right. The low end out of this thing is fantastic now. It's never sounded so good. Oh, I already had that turned off. Never mind. Anyhow, I'm very happy with this. Now the next thing to do would be to get into the turntable and fix that up. That won't be today, that'll be in a whole other video. Whenever I can get around to it, I want to get a stylus for this thing first. And I'd like to see if I can find at least the uh, single play spindle or the uh, 45 RPM spindle. This one, easy, just twist it and it comes off. No problem. <laughs> I had no idea this thing was capable of that kind of sound quality, but I'll take it. Anyway, while we're still waiting for the uh, the uh, idler tires to come for the TCK, whatever the heck it is, 75 that I'm waiting for, I got another video I'm going to start on real quick here, just in case. That just showed up from Japan. It's a Marantz CM6200. I always thought I'd get one of their tape decks before one of their mini disc units, but uh, I had to have this one as soon as I saw it. So we'll get into that next, I think. And hopefully those idler tires show up. Anyway, that's going to be it for today, guys. See you in the next one. Take care.